One of the most powerful features inside of Age of Wonders is the Empire Development Tree, where we spend our Imperium to unlock a whole load of sweet rewards. With long running abilities located along the populated side of the tree, and often one-off abilities located on the other branch, each branch of the tree of course reflects a certain affinity. By unlocking more tomes of magic or adding to your affinities in the faction creator, you can determine how quickly you unlock the branches of the tree. Each affinity point generates one income per turn, and of course, as turns tick along, you'll unlock more and more depending on how many affinity points you have. And as a quick example, by means of an introduction, I currently have 12 ticking over every turn in the shadow affinity, meaning I can reach right the way up and unlock the final thing. And despite being at the very end of my game, with only one point ticking away per turn in the Materium Affinity, you can see that I was unable to reach up and grab even the likes of Master Masons here, which would take me at this rate another 41 turns. So let's jump in and explore how to spend our Imperium on these wonderful unlocks. I'll be considering their rarity, the rarity of its effect, of course its overall power, its synergies with other things inside of the Affinity, and its opportunity cost. Let's jump in. Quickly though, if you wouldn't mind leaving a like or subscribing, these kinds of videos in particular take a lot of time and effort and I'd appreciate your support. Let's roll! Starting from the start here on the Age of Wonders 4 database, a brilliant way I think to visualize the tree, is slightly different to in-game, but I think it fits our purpose very well. Uh, let's start at the start where we have basic seafaring, and excavation. I'm going to bundle these two together because my assessment for them is almost the same. Basic seafaring lets us sail across the ocean, and excavation lets us dig out that earthen terrain in the underground, find new tiles, build larger cities, find goodies. They are two fairly exclusive abilities. They are two uh, fairly necessary abilities. Seafaring may be slightly more than excavation, but of course they're both map dependent. While some might argue they could use a tier of their own, I think they're comfortable S tier picks. They're great value, they provide something that's very difficult to get and incredibly useful. S tier, no trouble. Road building is next on our list, General Empire skill at the 80 cost point, and this one of course lets our armies build roads uh, as they move along hexes, and it costs us 3 gold per hex. This one you could argue is very similar to the other two, a universally pretty good ability that's applied early on in the general tree. I'm personally not entirely convinced that this is an S tier ability, of course Having roads is fantastic, you'll be able to move much faster. Thankfully the map actually has a lot of roads built in, and aside from perhaps connecting cities or building a more direct way towards an enemy, I'm not sure that this one is actually as much of a must pick as some of the other options on the list, and so for that reason I'll be placing it at an A tier ranking. A very powerful ability, but not as universally useful as some of the others, uh, and potentially maybe slightly expensive for you at the start of the game too, in a world where roads do already exist. Next we have Expanded Governance. This one I think deserves almost its own tier of itself, an S plus tier. It's a repeatable general right. So what that means is once I buy this the first time to increase my city cap by plus one for 200 Imperium, I can do it again and again and again. Uh, although of course the cost will increase. For example, the second time it'll cost 500 Imperium. So it does get more expensive. But having the extra city cap, not taking any of those massive penalties to yield like knowledge for being over your number of cities uh, is incredibly strong. Obviously cities are the driver of an empire. It's a no brainer that this one is a fantastic pickup uh, in almost all circumstances, allowing players to pick up extra cities and not suffer any of the penalty. For me, it's an S++ tier. <laughs> uh, no, but seriously, I will put it at the front of the group. I think it, um, while these two serve a very different function than the plus one city cap, the plus one city cap will likely provide you with uh, much more power, much more yield. Uh, it's a great benefit and granted more of a cost, but it's a no brainer, easy S tier. Requiring 120 affinity points to unlock, we have Diplomatic Focus. Gain plus one Whispering Stone for 100 Imperium. Uh, again, this is a universal, this won't be the case throughout the whole thing, but in this case, it is a universally good benefit. An extra Whispering Stone at the start. Obviously, you can pick up extra free cities, extra allies, vassals, however you want to play it. Having an extra Whispering Stone in your army, even if you just choose to give it to your own city to make it a more stable place, uh, is absolutely worthwhile, especially for this low cost. 
extra whispering stone for me uh, is an S tier option. I could see some arguments for placing it in A. You can pick these up in a few different places. Maybe you're playing on a map without free states, but by and large, generally, you're going to have them. It's going to be useful. If all else fails, you can use it on your own city. And back over on the left hand side of the tree in this case, what tend to be those one off abilities or those abilities that work a little bit differently than the rest. Here we have Right of the Last Stand, where each city in the Empire loses one population and immediately summons three tier one units. This is unlocked, of course, around the same time as that Whispering Stone, so you can get it fairly quickly in the early game where tier one units are likely to be the most successful. Uh, there are also other synergies with tier one units, uh, in particular, maybe looking at something like chaos or nature, summoning in the horde, a whole load of animals, token units, for example. Losing one population is a bit of a drawback for immediately summoning units. Uh, when this will be its most useful will be in the early game. You may have two cities, maybe three cities. You're summoning in six, potentially nine tier one units at the cost of three populations. So it's a little bit of a trade off here to get this one online. Useful for summoning units in a pinch, though. While grabbing all of those extra units at the start or near the start can be very useful to turn the tide of battle, potentially summoning you an extra army early on. Losing the population will, of course, limit your growth a little bit. It's effectively like losing many turns worth of growth in exchange for many turns worth of draft or uh, gold, right? That's kind of what it's doing. Training units in exchange for your food and your population. I think generally the trade-off is fair, and that's why I'm ranking it at an A tier. I just think it could be a little bit better, and the trade-off does hurt a bit. Next, we have advanced sensing. Your units and cities gain plus three sensing range for 100 Imperium and unlocked once we get 200 affinity points ranked in. Uh, plus three sensing range. Pretty good, right? Extra vision, uh, extra alertness. You'll be able to keep an eye out for the enemies and potentially scout things out a little faster than everyone else. I think that this is a generally quite useful benefit. There are um, a few other ways for us to get sensing range, both within the tree and externally, though that's not unusual for Age of Wonders 4. For me, I think this deserves either a B or an A rank. I'm going to place it at a high B tier rank. I think that while it doesn't provide any direct yield or any new benefit, like most of the other things that we've ranked have, the benefit that it does provide with the extra range on your units and your cities is very useful if you're potentially hard trying to hide from an enemy who's coming to fight you or, you know, the many other things that you might be looking to do with camouflage, hiding, scouting. It's useful, but it doesn't provide any direct yield. Uh, and for that reason, given its cost and the time that we unlock it, and the few other ways that we can get this ability, I'm placing it at a B tier. At 300 points for 150 Imperium, we have Forced March, which unlocks the abilities to push our armies a little bit further. March them again using the Forced March effect. I think that the Forced March effect is very useful for uh, traversing the map. Obviously, it's useful for closing in on a target, quickly coming back to defend a useful combat ability. Not so much a useful exploration ability, for example. I think at this point, you probably don't need to use that uh, on your scouts, for example. So generally, this will be a tactical use. I think that it is uh, fairly powerful. There are better ways to move around the map, don't get me wrong. Teleportation, teleportation units, spells, for example. But being able to move faster than everyone else is a really significant benefit. Uh, particularly at this stage, where you may not have things like teleporters or fancy spells to pull you out of the way. Uh, this is a nice movement ability. I'm placing Forced March at a high B tier. I think it deserves either an A or a B. Uh, the ability is very good. Like I say, use it to catch up on people, use it to go in for a fight. Brilliant, brilliant. However, positioning, uh, in my opinion, is just worth a little bit less than, say, direct yield, right? I'd take an extra 20 knowledge in exchange for not being able to Force March, for example. I would probably also take the plus one city cap instead of force march and a variety of other effects on this list. Uh, so for that reason, I'm placing it at a high B tier. Near the top of the general tree, getting slightly expensive, although it's important to note, of course, that the general tree is easier to get to the top of than all of the rest. So the negative penalties that I'm applying, the, the weighting, is actually very low because most of the time, it doesn't actually matter which affinity you're choosing, you're going to work towards this regardless. Siege specialization grants us one extra siege project slot, one extra ability to harass the defenders. 
to bring in five extra units, potentially, if you're unleashing the hounds or uh, building siege equipment, whatever it may be. It's a great way to bring extra units into a fight beyond the normal 18 versus 18 cap or weaken the enemy defenses, reduce the time of a siege. Uh, this, I think, is a very powerful empire skill. Yes, there is another way, of course, that we could look at it inside of the Materium Affinity, but being in the general affinity makes it even better, of course. Uh, and it is for that reason that I'm going to rank it quite highly. I hummed and hard whether this one deserved an S tier or an A tier. Having one extra siege slot has made a big difference to me when I'm getting ready, building up for a siege. However, a lot of the synergy for this one sits within the Materium tree, uh, although you can argue that for a lot of the general things, they are just general abilities that are generally pretty good. Uh, and I think that this one is uh, very good. However, of course, not every player will be conducting sieges. It would be unfair for me to assume that every game will have sieges. There's one victory condition that will absolutely require some, uh, but the other two, other three, do not. Uh, it is for that reason that I'm ranking this at an A tier. Very powerful. Slightly late unlock, though, thankfully within the general tree, and I think it's a solid A contender. And finally, right at the top of the tree, we have teleporter infrastructure. This one will, of course, be uh, slightly difficult to get towards, but nowhere near as difficult, maybe, as some of the other uh, 500 point costs inside of this specific empire trees. Here, for 200 Imperium, we can build teleporter province improvements that let us bounce between our cities. That's kind of all you need to know. Quite straightforward and very powerful. The ability to traverse the map, move between cities is incredibly strong. Yes, we can pick it up a little bit inside uh, of some of the blue tomes, for example, but having this general ability, a constructible tile, I mean, it's just fantastic. I was thinking about weighting uh, deductions more heavily on it for being so expensive, because you will get it obviously much later than everything else. You may not be able to utilize it as readily, but because it's inside of the general tree, I weight that less because, of course, general points can be collected from anywhere. And so for me, it's an S tier. Moving on to nature, fruitful integration allows us to found or absorb cities in two fewer turns and newly founded or absorbed cities gain plus one population. Plus one population. Uh, very good on all of our early cities. We're getting this very early on. Of course, it's quite cheap. Here we're getting into the specific trees, so I won't repeat this every time, but of course we will need to specifically unlock their Tomes of Magic to start to feed points into unlocking them. Thankfully in the early stages it's fairly easy, you really just need one and have it tick away for 10 turns. Fruitful integration is fantastic. We found our cities faster and they start with an extra territory because they have an extra population, so that's all sorts of extra free yield. It's a no-brainer for me, everybody. Uh, this one is an absolute romper of an S tier. Next up, we have soil tenders. Farms gain plus five food at the cost of 75 Imperium. This one, really straightforward. Every farm in your empire is going to get five additional food. Of course, by default, they'll start with five. Now they'll have 10. If you're building them on pastures, they'll be up to 20, thanks to the bonus 10, for example. Growth is everything, and this growth happens very early on in the game. It's uh, fairly easy to unlock. So you're moving down the nature tree, you shouldn't struggle. An extra five food across, let's say, ten farms even in the empire. Three or four per city, two or three if you've got four cities. Uh, it's very powerful. Easy growth early on. Food is king. Wonderful stuff. S tier for me. Next we have natural recovery. Uh, this one allows our friendly units inside of our own territory, our own domain, to regenerate an additional 15 hit points per turn. This is a, an interesting one. Of course, we already heal in friendly territory. What this is doing is uh, allowing us to do it much faster. So if you were previously maybe waiting two turns to heal, now you'll likely only have to wait one. However, I'm not sure that that's entirely strong. I think that its usefulness comes potentially in two scenarios. The first is when you're being uh, aggressively attacked or you're aggressively attacking someone who happens to be right on your border and you can utilize this to heal. The second is if you're traversing around uh, your broader territories, maybe you're fighting NPC army after NPC army, clearing things out, and this will allow you to heal up a little bit faster. Are there other ways to heal units? Absolutely, of course. We have heal spells. We can naturally heal. We could send in a different army. Uh, but I think that the extra regeneration on friendly territory is still a nice benefit. While the benefit is strong, I won't be ranking this one as highly as the others. I think that there is uh, certainly better things that you could be spending your Imperium on 
uh, particularly in the slightly earlier stages of the game, other than a passive heal on your units inside of your own territory. Again, it's very good, don't get me wrong, uh, but I am going to place it at a C tier. Well, how can it be very good if you placed it at a C tier? It serves its function, it does. I just think that its function is somewhat limited. Uh, certain use cases, and it may or may not actually make a difference uh, by the time your army gets to where it's going. For me, it's a C tier. Next, we have expert sailors providing plus two food to coast and river provinces, and that's about it. Uh, coast, of course, is generally not a great, not a great yield. Uh, the harbors aren't fantastic. Many people will argue that they get really good if you work your way through the buildings, and they're right, they do. But you have to work your way through all the buildings. You're also not getting quarries or farms or foresters, which are all required for early boosts. Uh, it's for that reason that I tend to view the coastal tiles as uh, less valuable than most of the land ones, particularly in the first half of the game. I don't really think there's much of a competition. Is plus two food enough for me to start claiming harbors early to mid game instead of claiming my forests, quarries, and farms that I need to get my boosted buildings, I don't think it is. And while this Expert Sailors provides a really good benefit to, let's say, somewhat weaker tiles or builds around the ocean, firstly, you may not have any ocean, and secondly, you may not want to use it, given those other priorities that I've listed out around boosted buildings, etc. I give Expert Sailors a B tier pick. I think there are uh, a few builds where it ends up being an S tier, a must pick. And then there are a lot of builds where it ends up being a fairly low priority, likely providing uh, less food, much less food, than the plus five food on farms that we saw earlier. Uh, for that reason, I'll place it at a B tier, giving it slightly higher than C or D because adding yield to those crappy ocean tiles uh, is somewhat rare. And this is one of the ways you can do it if that's the build you're going down. On the left-hand side of the tree are one-off abilities. We have uh, a fairly nice one, the ability to immediately summon a spirit wolf with guardian spirit and resurgence at your throne city. So this is a powerful spirit wolf unit. Uh, it comes with the guardian spirit and resurgence abilities. Uh, it's a nice power level if you're going down the nature line to pick up a fairly strong unit early. Of course, this is a one-off ability and it costs 150 Imperium uh, putting it in line with the cost, nearly, uh, granted 50 less, of a new city. Or many of the other options on this list, like half the price to add five food to farms. So putting it in balance, it's a great unit, but it is a one-off spend of our Imperium. Difficult to place. Difficult to place in terms of how good it is and what it deserves, I think. For me, I think this is a C-tier pick, largely because of its kind of one-off spend in nature. Somewhat earlier on in the game, you will still be struggling a bit with your Imperium. You'll want to be growing your cities, founding new cities, uh, getting lots of these other abilities, and I'm not sure that this one provides enough power to do so. Of course it's useful in a pinch. Of course it's great to get an extra unit into your army. But you know what? So is the Rally of Legions mechanic. And if you've managed to pick up an Ancient Wonder or a free city, which you probably have, then I would argue that's probably a better, more reliable and useful way to pick up higher tier units uh, early in the game. Expansive Reach is up next for 120 points ticking over per turn into the Nature Affinity and 200 Imperium. Our cities can expand to provinces two extra provinces away from the city centre. This is obviously very useful. Uh, you may not be using it necessarily in, in some sort of big, you know, one city challenge, here I am, grabbing all the tiles. I would argue on most maps, you wouldn't have the space to do it. But what you can do, of course, is reach out for specific ones. You can reach that ancient wonder that you might have been able to grab before, or that uh, a magical material, or whatever it may be. It's a nice way to expand out your cities if you don't want to be building extra outposts. Although it's important to note that extra outposts do exist. They exist for uh, gold rather than Imperium and they will let us grab extra tiles. Will it feed into the city synergy, however? No. 
I give Expansive Reach a B tier. I think it does what it says on the tin, does a good job of it. It will not be useful for every single playthrough. It will not be useful for close maps, tight maps, uh, certain builds that don't favor having massive large cities. Uh, but I think what it does uh, can and will be very useful in some instances. It's a B tier for me. Next, we have Wild Expansion. Uh, this is quite an interesting one. Completing a province annexation, so grabbing a territory, summons an animal unit under your control, depending on the province. So this is a nice way to spam out extra token units every time we grow. Of course it synergizes well with nature because we're going to be growing our cities faster with extra populations and likely we'll have some animals, animal synergies as well. I think this is a, a really nice way to tick up a relatively cheap, somewhat weak, granted, but numerous units, numerous animal units, uh, great synergies within the class. I place this one at an A tier. Of course I'm assuming as I go through that you will have some synergies and you will have moved through this tree to get here, at least in some respect. And I think that this is a great way for us to grab extra units with huge synergy. Uh, it's an A tier pick for me, but only just. I want to make that clear. Only just. Back on the left hand side of our tree we have Right of Expansive Growth, that one off ability. Uh, this one gives all of our cities in Empire plus one population. Bam. Straight away. Okay. By itself that's quite nice. Of course we'll grab extra territories, maybe we synergize it with the one we were just looking at, right? So there's obviously synergies. But how good actually is this? Well it cost me 250 Imperium, and of course the opportunity cost of not picking up something else. <laughs> that goes without saying. And I'll get one population on my cities. Perhaps I have Four cities. I've got my extra city cap online. I've built my four cities. I gain one population on each of them, one extra territory. This is very good if I have very large cities that take a long time to grow. And it's not so good when I don't. Of course, I can use attract population to grow a city by plus one population. And I've got 250 Imperium to spend. I think I can comfortably do it on two of my cities maybe three. I mean, obviously it depends on how close they are to gaining their next population. And that's the other difficult thing about this is how big is the city when you're gaining the population? It's a difficult one to rank therefore because it's very situationally dependent, but I don't think for its cost, it provides as much benefit as it might seem at first. Due to the fact that it also doesn't really do much unique for me, there's literally an option already to attract population. I'm going to place this one at a C tier. Absolutely has value in massive large empires with huge cities where it takes a while to grow. But that value drops off very fast earlier in the game thanks to the attract population function that we can of course use repeatedly uh, instead of having to place a one-off thing in our tree. Next we have natural order. Provinces with the forest province feature, something that of course we can lean into inside of the nature tomes grant us plus two city stability at the cost of 300 Imperium. Uh, this is a nice way, of course, to get stability. Other ways exist throughout this tree and throughout the Tomes of Magic and city buildings. So you have plenty of other options in terms of gaining stability. And of course, I'll deduct a little bit for the focus that it has to be provinces with forest. Yes, we can terraform our way through instead of summoning units or whatever else we might want to do with our mana. I don't think this one quite delivers the power that it needs to, given how specialized it is. For me, this is a D tier pick. Yes, it has synergy in the class. Yes, you will be able to terraform forests. But for plus two city stability, I'm not quite buying that trade off here. It's relatively expensive on the tree. You'll be unlocking it somewhat late. Uh, and I'm not sure it quite delivers what it needs. If you're in a pinch and you're struggling with stability, you pick this. If you're not, I don't think you do. Next we have Druidic Care. This is an interesting one because for the first time we're able to get a resource that isn't basically food or populations. Here we have mana cities gain five additional mana for each resource node inside of their domain. You will have many resource nodes uh, quite easily and quite comfortably. I think you'll be able to pick up an additional let's say 20 to 30 mana per city. Uh, this is a very powerful effect not just because of course it synergizes with having big cities that have reached out to grab lots of territories, but because it also reaches into something else, a new yield that we haven't been able to get from this tree, or from a lot of the internal synergies in nature. We're potentially summoning in a lot of animals, we've got a lot of upkeep, 
This is a great pick. Druidic Care for me deserves to be at least an A tier, given its ability to generate quite a lot of mana, potentially offsetting all of your upkeep at the point in the game where you're grabbing it. Uh, But for me, it's actually an S tier. Very close, somewhere sitting on this fence, uh, but I'm going to rank it up here. That mana gain is fantastic, it is quite rare, and it is very useful. Back over on the single side of the tree, we have the Rite of Awakening, where we instantly gain plus 20 knowledge for each province in our empire's domain. Nice. Now, of course, it's a one-off ability. And that sucks, because if it was reoccurring, it would be S++. As far as a one-off goes, I'm trading 350 Imperium for 20 knowledge for each province uh, inside of my empire's domain. We're likely to have quite a few provinces at this point. Perhaps four cities times 12 provinces, 48, maybe around 50. 50 times 20 is 1,000. So we're getting about 1,000 knowledge in exchange for 350 Imperium, let's say. Of course, your results may differ. I think the utility of Rite of Awakening is uh, largely useful for researching uh, a really expensive spell or to push you through into, say, a tier 4 tome, a tier 5 tome, that kind of thing. Uh, rather than, of course, generic knowledge input, because it is just a one-off thing. We're trading 350 Imperium for it, so we're trading a rare resource for also quite a useful, slightly rare resource in knowledge. Uh, A difficult one for me to rank, it's a one-off, which also maybe isn't quite as good. Uh, For me, I'm going to place this one at a B tier. I think it does have value, it does synergize with nature, and knowledge is a very rare resource. Here's an opportunity for us to get a whole load of it but it is just a one-off thing. So effectively, you're kind of trading one Imperium for three or four knowledge and doing that once and then forgetting about it. For me, it's just a B tier. Rangers are up next. Movement cost for friendly units inside of our domain is reduced by two movement points, so we'll be able to move faster. Uh, Movement, of course, across the map is very useful, right? For the same reason that teleportation is fantastic, having extra movement is nice too. You'll be able to close the gap or get back to defend faster, or whatever it may be. Unlikely to be useful at this point for scouting the map. Rangers for me is a B tier ability. It's quite expensive. We're unlocking it quite late. It requires a lot of specialization. And it provides us with a bit of extra movement. If we can't teleport, if we can't use spells to move ourselves around, uh, this is a great way to traverse the map a little bit faster. But ultimately, that's sort of all it it is, really. Useful if you're reaching out to fight somebody or having to run back because you didn't leave any units to defend. But perhaps not so useful if you're kind of already in place and in control. And finally, right at the top of the nature tree, Druidic Empire. Acquiring new population requires minus 50% less food. Woof. Yes, it's unlocked late. Yes, it's expensive. But 50% less food around the time you unlock this is very strong. You might go from taking 10 turns to gain a new territory down to 5. And that's, of course, repeated across all, what I'm going to assume, all 5 plus of your cities at this point, uh, that's really good, really good. A great boost to late game growth, unparalleled actually, in terms of its power and its boost to growth at this period in the game. Yes, it's expensive, but man, it's good. For me, this is an S tier pickup. Moving on to the chaos tree, we have Call of Chaos. Defeating an infestation grants your unit based on the infestation level defeated. So basically you go in, you fight your infestation, and you get a free unit back out of it, effectively getting, if you like, the cost that it would have been to train that unit, the draft or or the gold or the mana, whatever it might have been. At 50, it's a pretty cheap pickup. You're going to be grabbing this early on, and I think it's a nice benefit, a a little bit of extra fodder, a few extra units early. Nice. Will you be fighting a huge number of infestations? Probably not. Maybe you get this off three or, or four times, potentially. Three or four extra units for 50 Imperium. I think this is an A tier pick. I don't think it quite really delivers the power because you can't just sort of universally continue to farm this. You are limited a little bit. People may steal your infestations before you can get to them. But what it does deliver are units for a very low cost, 50 Imperium divided by the four units you'll get, right? It's 12 and a half Imperium each and relatively early in the game. A solid pick, A tier. 
Impressment is next. Tier 1 units cost 30% less upkeep. Very strong synergies within the class here. You're likely to have quite a few tier one units. You're likely to be leaning into that horde mentality, potentially lots of token units too, and they'll cost 30% less upkeep, saving you money right from the start and throughout the game that you can redeploy into other things. I think impressment is an S tier ability, not because it's S tier powerful. It doesn't blow me out of the water with its power. But what I do like about it is that it saves me money right from the start, every turn, and it has an incredible synergy with what will likely be units that really do focus on that kind of tier one horde mentality. For me, those fantastic synergies and its very low cost allow me to rank it around the S or A tiers. I'm going to place it just in the S tier. Battlefield looting uh, actually works in quite a similar way, but in this case, we're getting plus three gold per unit tier of units killed in combat. Kill a tier one unit, you get three bucks. Kill a tier three unit, you get nine. Every combat for the rest of the game inside of the chaos tree. Again, the synergies here, I think, are great top points for synergy. Uh, having the extra goal will allow me to focus potentially on developing buildings, right? Boosting them, getting them online while I continue to fight. Of course, I've got other internal synergies here around my units costing less to begin with, and now they're making me money as I fight. I think these two go really well together, obviously, and also lean into that really making money out of fighting. It's incentivizing me to do what I do well even more. Again, I think just like the previous one, that they could belong in A tier, or they could belong in S tier. And I'll actually, these two I'll actually kind of leave up to you. I mean, obviously it's all up to you and you're welcome to disagree. You could slot them both down here. I think that's justified. You could slot them both up here. And I think that's also kind of justified. Uh, for me, they rank right at the top, largely because you get to unlock them early. You get benefits from them uh, most turns, right? You're going to be doing a lot of fighting. I think they deserve an S tier ranking. Lure of the Horde is up next for 150 Imperium. When you win a battle, you have a 50% chance of gaining a tier 1 or 2 unit that can be produced in a city. Interesting. So I have a chance of gaining a tier 1 or 2, and then it will be produced in the city. So it won't be just immediately summoned uh, onto the army where the battle was, right? And I've only got half a chance at it paying off, but for each battle that I win, I do have half a chance of getting a tier 1 or a tier 2 unit in one of my cities. So there are a few sort of qualifying layers to get this to pay off. First, you have to flip a coin after you've won a battle. And then regardless of how many units were in that battle, you have a chance to get one, tier 1 or 2. Some synergies and some strengths. But I don't think this is parable, even anywhere near comparable to some of the power that we're getting from the earlier ones. Lure of the Horde for me is a B tier pick. It does have some synergies, of course. We will be doing many battles, and it's nice to get one unit, or have half a chance of getting one out of a battle, even if it is restricted to uh, spawning at my city. Nice synergies, not quite enough power for me to rank it any higher than that. Over on the left hand side of the tree, we have Right of War. It allows us to instantly summon, because of course this is our one off side of the tree, a bandit army under our control. To our throne city. The bandit army itself is not particularly good, right? You're not getting a whole load of high tier, powerful units with any kind of experience. But of course, you're getting the kind of unit that you might want inside of a chaos affinity. A relatively cheap tier one synergizes with the stuff you've already got. It can be useful in a pinch to quickly whip up an army, right? What you're getting is six units for 150 Imperium. And of course, as I've mentioned, they will be slightly weaker than the rest. So I do have to sort of factor that in. But when I look at it strictly on the, the prospect of 150 Imperium equals six units, eh, it's not a bad deal. I think Right of War is an A tier pick. I think it synergizes nicely with chaos within a, potentially a desire to go out fast early and hard, whether you're fighting other players, city-states, or even just like infestations and ancient wonders around the map, having the extra units and being able to instantly summon them in like a rally of lieges on steroids, I think is a pretty good benefit, even if they are a slightly lower grade of unit. It's an A grade for me. 
Returning to the reoccurring side of the tree, we have Skilled Raiders, which gives us a nice ability. Pillaging a province takes one fewer turn, which is actually really useful because standing around for two turns pillaging something, quite annoying. Pillaging it in one, much better. Uh, and it yields 50% more yield. Pillaging units are also healed for 20 hit points more than units might heal with other abilities on the tree, like the one in Shadow, for example, that heals us for 15. Of course, the requirement is that we need to pillage in order to pull it off. We should be able to do this, though. This is not actually that difficult to march an army onto a tile, pillage it in a turn, get 50% extra reward, and heal, allowing you to continue to push through enemy territory without having to turn around and come back or rely on spells from other trees. I think that this has some really great synergy with obviously with war and with combat, uh, but also with building up the empire. You'll be able to keep your units alive for longer, meaning you won't have to construct as many, uh, and the yield that you get from pillaging will be pretty decent, honestly. You'll be able to make a bit of cash money with this one. I think Skilled Raiders is a very good pickup and has strong synergies in class. It's being able to heal in enemy territory that really pushes it up to the A tier for me. Otherwise, I probably would have, uh, the S tier, I probably would have placed it at A tier if it didn't have that. But if I can use enemy tile improvements, obviously burning them down in a turn or whatever, to make me, say, 100 bucks and heal my units in their territory before a fight, I mean, that's just so good. It's an S tier for me. Next up, we have War Slaves, very on theme for a chaotic empire. Raising cities grants plus one population to one of your cities for every three population of the city that was raised. This is, a, this is an interesting one. So to get any benefit at all, you have to raise a city. Now, obviously, if you're going across the world, destroying everything as you go, you may be raising stuff because you just can't keep it within your city camp. However, of course, you do have other options like vassalizing the city instead of raising it, uh, keeping yield generating from it. Obviously here, it's trying to lean you specifically down, don't vassalize, burn. And if you burn, let's say, uh, uh, an enemy throne city or a large city, 12 population, uh, you'll bring four of those back to your own cities for new territories to claim. So it certainly has a powerful effect, but it's really a trade-off. You're trading off keeping that city. You're trading off vassalizing it, making it independent and gaining its yield in exchange or burning it down, not having to worry about it in future, freeing up those tiles that it's sitting on as well, and getting some pops into your city. It's one of the more complicated ones, I think, on the tree, because its trade-off is, is very stark, right? It's shifting you specifically down the raise focus, and really disincentivizing things like expanding your city cap and keeping them or, or vassalizing them. I think it leans in well, of course, with the chaos, burning of cities, but the benefit itself of four population in your cities, while that's great for your synergies, is trading off against, of course, three times that number of population who already exist in an already existing city. War Slaves, I think, is one of those ones that's great if you're going down the, the raise route. Maybe you're playing with chosen destroyers you, your, or your city cap is lowered through uh, the Materium uh, society improvement that you get from the Pantheon tree. But outside of that, I'm not sure that this provides enough benefit from the extra population to outweigh the benefits that I could have had from keeping the city or keeping it uh, as a free city uh, vassalized ally. For that reason, I'm ranking this one at a C tier, though I acknowledge on some builds it would rock it up to around an A tier. On the left hand side, our one off ability, we have Right of Chosen Warriors. Our cities gain plus 500 draft this turn at the cost of 250 Imperium. Hopefully, you weren't burning your cities down like we were meant to with the one we were looking at just before. Otherwise, you won't be able to get any draft out of this. A slight anti synergy on this cross path on the tree, potentially. 500 draft is very good, of course. Draft is, however, only one part of the equation to training units. You'll also need to have the money to train them and upkeep them. Uh, it is for that reason that I don't rank this one particularly highly. Yes, I can use it to generate maybe uh, 500 draft across three or, or four cities at this point, and that's great so long as I have the gold to support it. Essentially, what we're doing is trading Imperium for draft, and don't get me wrong, 
it's a pretty juicy trade-off. About 250 Imperium might get me 1,500 to 2,000 draft this turn. Question is, can I make the most of it? And do I have the gold to be able to do so? And that is a caveat that significantly weakens Right of Chosen Warriors is fairly powerful trade-off ability from the start. And of course, it's a one-time deal. 250 Imperium will not get you a reoccurring benefit here, just that one-off huge boost to draft income. In some ways, I think this is stronger than the right of war that we saw earlier, summoning in a free army of likely pretty crappy tier one units, because we get to train our own units, the ones that we've unlocked. The downside, of course, is that we have to use gold to do so, and that they'll be split across all of our cities. They won't be clustered in one place. We're not summoning in one army. We're bringing in draft for all of our cities. It is for that reason that I rank this one at a B tier. Don't get me wrong. That draft boost, that trade-off, is very high value. But it's only one piece of the equation to getting these units online and bringing them into a cohesive army. For that reason, I think this is a B tier ability. Next up we have Tireless Marches, which relates back to the Forced March ability we were talking about earlier. Forced March costs 50% less mana and inflicts 50% less damage to your units. Of course those Forced Marches have trade-offs. You can push extra space, but at a cost. This one reduces those costs. 50% less mana, 50% less damage. Uh, and we'll keep that for the rest of the game. We'll have to pay 300 Imperium to do so. Uh, the question for me here is, how often are you using the Forced March ability? It's very useful in a pinch. One of the only ways to travel across the map quickly, early in the game, especially when you don't have teleporters. And so for that reason, I consider it to be quite strong. This makes it even better. Great. We're going to really stomp around the map now at a reduced cost. However, of course, fairly high up in the tree, and we only get the ability when we choose to use Forced March. So it's somewhat niche in what it does. I do have to acknowledge the synergies here, of course. We're going to want to be stomping across the map, finding enemies to pillage and raid and so on and so forth. But given it has the prerequisite of having Forced March and using Forced March, uh, for me, I'm ranking it at uh, a C tier. You need this really to get the benefit out of this, obviously. And then once you have it, you're only saving a little bit in an ability that is already a little costly. It's a C for me. Next, we have the Spoils of Destruction. Raising cities, of course, leaning into that side of things, uh, yields plus 20 gold permanent income. Man, the, the Chosen Destroyers build really loves this, obviously, because of the extra money that you get. However, the Chosen Destroyers perk itself provides you with gold and mana and research permanent income. So if you are playing a game where raising cities is going to be a big part of your focus, uh, you're likely much better to get that and then, you know, down the line pick this up as a nice extra, but not really the core part of your strategy. Because 20 gold, granted permanently and per turn, which is super nice, uh, isn't as much as that Chosen Destroyers. It's really only a quarter of what Chosen Destroyers does. However, 20 gold per turn per city raised is nice. And you can make a lot of money out of this just from burning down a couple of cities. And I think that's what separates it apart. This doesn't require you to really focus in on that chosen destroyer's raising build. You just need to run across a couple of enemy cities that are small, annoying, in the way, not worth keeping or vassalizing to start to make some decent money out of spoils of destruction. And Spoils of Destruction doesn't limit us in any other way. It doesn't take away from our city cap or anything like that. I think it's a, a pretty powerful effect. Of course, you do need to burn down cities to get it. And it is unlocked quite late. At this point, we are requiring quite a bit of specialization to get here. Uh, for me, it's a solid A tier ability. Loads of extra money per turn from the cities that you raise from this point onwards. Destined Conquerors comes up next, giving us plus 30 grievances against all other empires that can't be traded or lost. This will help us a lot to justify the conflicts that we may or may not be entering. Uh, those grievances, we can't generate cash from them, but we don't want to, because we don't want the enemy to be able to get rid of them. So that's great. We also gain 50 gold and 50 mana per active war we're involved in. A nice ability, absolutely. 50 bucks, 50 mana, 
per active war likely will be involved in a few of these. This is a, a good one to position around the end game, around justifying your wars and generating a little bit of income from them to cover likely what will be a really overblown budget in your unit upkeep side, right? That's why it's mana and gold, because those are your unit upkeeps. It'll do a nice job uh, at really reducing those, at least a little bit in the short term. And the extra grievances that are generated that can't be traded will do wonders to keep your Imperium up. Because when you claim uh, those unjustified wars, you tank your Imperium, among other things. Having those extra grievances on your side uh, will do you wonders in sustaining your empire and removing a lot of the negative effects that come from war. It does have a very expensive cost, opportunity cost, of course, but I think it delivers very well for the internal synergies and has a very strong effect. I'm giving this one an A tier. And right down the bottom of the chaos tree, we have two options, which makes it uh, slightly unusual. Of course, we have a one off on the left, and on the right, we have Reign of Destruction. Raising cities takes two less turns and yields plus. 50% more resources. And if we've leaned in a little bit already into raising cities, then this really is our crowning jewel. We'll also gain a tier three unit of the raised cities culture as well. So every time you burn down one of those cities, you get a decent tier three unit, potentially unique, 50% more resources. So you'll be making a lot of money out of this and it happens much faster. And that shouldn't be slept on either because burning cities down can take quite some time. Like four turns is a long time in the late game when you're posturing around the map and, and doing all sorts of different things. And I think that Reign of Destruction makes a lot of money, makes burning down cities easier. And that free unit shouldn't be slept on either. Tier three unit, difficult to get for free in Age of Wonders 4. The downside to Reign of Destruction is that it does require to get really any benefit out of it at all that you burn down some cities. So it's not actually just a universal thing that's going to tick over every turn. I do have to act on this one. When I do, though, I get a lot of yield. And of course, there are strong internal synergies. Due to its cost, though, and the fact that you don't get this until quite late in the piece, I'm going to rank this one at a B tier. I don't think it's overall power. Extra 50% yield is nice. Don't get me wrong. I might make a few couple of hundred bucks out of that. Uh, justifies its 500 Imperium and late unlock cost. Of course, internal synergies are great, but for me, I think this is a B tier. And then over on the left-hand side, we can trade 500 Imperium for Baylor, a beautiful big demon beast of a, of a unit. Uh, it's also a great unit for avoiding some of the casualties that can come from uh, morale loss due to the fact that it is just a one big Baylor. It will cost you one population, but that's not unusual when you train Baylor. Uh, you will have to sacrifice something normally to train it. So in this case, actually, we're looking at a slightly easier way to train a Baylor unit. And instead of it costing me my, my whatever my base yields it's going to cost, I can choose to spend 500 Imperium to get it instead. That is a steep price to pay, obviously. It's the highest price that we can pay on this tree, really. But Baylor is a really great unit, and you get to immediately summon it for a much cheaper cost across population and its yield cost to recruit. So I think as far as training Baylors go, this is by far the best way to do it. But it is a one-off thing, and it's costing me 500 Imperium instead of the other resources. Getting Baylor with Power of the Slaughter is absolutely great. 500 Imperium is a very different cost to what it will cost you normally. I think it is perhaps slightly overpriced in comparison to its traditional yield cost, but being able to bang it out and bang it out early and often, well, not early, but easily, actually, uh, I, I think is a real saving grace for it. For me, it, it doesn't deserve an S tier or really even an A tier. I'm going to place it at a B tier ranking just because of its one-off, slightly expensive nature, although the payoff is great. Let's have a look now at the Astral Tree. Starting us off right at the start, 10 points we need to tick into it and 50 Imperium. We'll gain 20 combat casting points and world map casting points. So it'll be easier for us to cast perhaps more expensive spells or what have you uh, in the world. We'll be able to summon our units in faster and of course inside of combat as well. Uh, these points can be somewhat difficult to earn. Obviously if you're leaning down this tree you'll have a better way to do it. But there aren't a lot of, say, buildings, for example, that can generate casting points. They're a somewhat rarer niche resource. I think casting reserves is really good. Uh, benefit right from the start of the game. 
cast my spells a little bit faster. I think the combat casting points uh, are especially useful. Uh, for me, I think it deserves either an S or an A tier ranking. It's one of those ones that I sat on the fence on for a while. You know, how useful really are these combat points? Does their usefulness fall off quickly? For me, I think it's an A tier ranking and a solid one at that. Astral Inspiration is next, unlocked again pretty early on. Whenever a skill is unlocked, researched, I should say, the knowledge cost of another one is reduced by one quarter, 25%. Of course, there's a bit of RNG here. The thing that it's reducing may not be something that I want to research. Uh, that effect does potentially fade a little bit as you move through tomes and start to unlock tomes that have fewer spells, uh, meaning you're, you're likely to be interested in a lot of them. The 25% saving, though, as it stacks up over time, maybe we call it a 15% or something around that mark, because some of the boosts I won't be able to utilize at all, I think is still very powerful. This is a great way to gain knowledge early and keep it throughout the rest of the game. 25% might knock a turn off each of the research items, meaning that you'll move through the research cycle faster as well. You might end up even in a situation where you're researching something just because it's cheaper, so you can move through to the next research cycle and get an even better tome. So sometimes the value lost out of unlocking a random skill might not be lost entirely. I think this is a very powerful trade. I weight knowledge slightly higher than other resources like gold. I'd take plus five knowledge over plus five gold any day. I think that the opportunity cost of the knowledge is greater. And while there is a little bit of randomness to this, I think it's saving grace is that you get it really early. Really, really early, actually. Very easy to grab this one and get a 25% research discount every time you research a skill on a random skill. The randomness is a penalty, but it's not enough for me to knock it down. I give it a low S tier ranking. Adaptive research is up next. Locking and shuffling research skills costs 50% less. So if you don't like the options that you're given, you can re-roll or lock uh, at half the cost. Of course, this does synergize kind of nicely with the random thing being reduced because we can re-roll and try and find our reduced research. Uh, we also get uh, another really nice benefit that research structures in our cities cost 50% less gold and production to build. That's massive. Like that is huge. And some of those late game ones could potentially take you, you know, 10 or 12 turns by the time you start getting through to tier three or tier four research buildings. And this slashes them in half. It's more powerful than the boosted building ability by far. And it is applied across all of your cities and all of their research structures. Combine that with the, the nice synergy of being able to shuffle through and find what you want quicker. Adaptive research for me is very powerful. Adaptive research, you absolutely deserve an S tier. And it actually brings up an interesting point that there's quite a bit of diversity within these rankings as well. Like this is a high S tier. The one that we looked at before it, it barely qualifies. In fact, you actually could probably make a solid justification that it deserves to be further down in the A tier because of that randomness associated to it. Uh, but for me, I will leave it here, just in the A tier with a very strong contender coming off. Maybe one of the best ones we've reviewed so far, actually, just because of when we get it and what it does. Quickening is up next, and it's quite straightforward. 150 Imperium, and we can cast spells on the first turn of combat, so we can get our buffs off on the first turn. We can start summoning units on the first turn. We can degrade their morale or slow them down on the first turn. It's a nice advantage. Obviously, it's only a one-turn advantage, but... It's good enough, I think, that it gives you just that step forward, that step ahead of the enemy. One extra unit, one extra debuff, slow them down so that you can outposition them or flank them early on. I think quickening is strong in what it does. For me, quickening is an A tier effect. It does give us that front foot, and it's nice. Will we be able to utilize it to completely destroy the enemy, though? No, it's only one turn's difference. It is ultimately only one spell. And early on, especially when we're getting this, that's likely to have much of an impact. But it is reoccurring, long-lasting, and a significant advantage over our enemies. I'll give it an A tier. And on the left-hand side, as a one-off, we can choose to trade 150 Imperium for 1,000 mana. <laughs> interesting. Really interesting. If I play it out on a per-turn basis, which might be a useful way to think about it. It's, say I'm getting 50 Imperium a turn at this point. That's three turns worth of Imperium. 
for 1,000 mana. Now, what that is per turn is entirely up to you. Of course, there's some strong synergies. Perhaps that's 10 turns worth of mana for three turns worth of Imperium. Maybe it's 20 turns, maybe it's only five. Your results will vary, of course. I don't think this is a particularly strong benefit. It's one of those ones that is nice to get you out of a pinch, right? Oh crap, I'm out of mana, I haven't been building any of my structures. How am I going to pay this upkeep? Bam, there it is. But it won't ultimately provide a more sustainable empire moving forward, right? It's a one-off ability, of course. Good for getting me out of a pinch or when I really need it. But if I'm growing a sustainable empire through this empire development tree, I may not actually be in a situation where trading off my city development imperium is worthwhile for mana, even if it's a 3, 4, 5, 6x trade-off. For me, this is a C-tier pick. I think there are a couple of um, niche situations where it's very good if you're in a pinch and you've mismanaged your mana. Uh, also, maybe you've unlocked a really powerful race transformation spell or something that you just need a significant surge to get you across the line. I think that's where it's useful. Outside of that, I don't think it especially is. Next, we have Philosopher's Soldiers, where you gain knowledge whenever a unit gains a rank. You'll gain ranks periodically, of course, depending on how much you're fighting and whether you can keep your units alive. The knowledge gain isn't huge. The cost, I mean, we're around the middle of the tree now. Uh, knowledge is a, a useful resource, though, don't get me wrong, so I do give it some benefit for that. But I don't think that this one is particularly appealing. I don't think it quite has enough behind it, right? Enough actual information for starters behind it, but also enough of an ability for us to quantify how much we get versus how much it costs. I'm going to place Philosopher Soldiers uh, in the middle at a B tier. It's one that I'd like to know a little bit more about before I gave it a proper ranking. I'd like to play test it more, figure out how quickly my units are ranking up, how often are they staying alive to do so, and how much knowledge will they actually earn? How much will I actually get over time from this middle of the tree unlock? For me, it's a B tier. And that puts us about halfway through the tree. Uh, a lot of feedback that I had on my Tomes of Magic tier list video was that it was just simply too long. People didn't want to watch a feature length film in one sitting, and for some reason, returning to a video, you know, finding it again, all of those sort of steps, they don't often tend to happen for a lot of people. So at your request, I'm going to divide this tier list in half. We're going to leave it here with general nature chaos and, and the beginning of uh, Astral Underway, and then we'll move through the rest of these ones and the final three in my next video, which of course I'll release uh, very shortly after this one, because the goal here isn't to farm views, it's just to make the product more of an appealing and useful product. I want the video to actually provide value and for people to see it. And the feedback that I got last time was that something that's an hour and a half in length just isn't quite going to capture that need well enough. Uh, by all means, leave feedback below. Let me know if you'd prefer to see me break them up one by one per video. I also heard that. I think that that takes it a step too far. There's too many uploads, uh, in my opinion. And maybe dividing it in half strikes a good balance between those uh, feedback groups. Thank you so much for joining me, and I'll see you all for part two next time.